ETN World News, news and inspiration with Leah Tillock. Hello and welcome to ATN World News. I'm Leah and it's great to be with you, the listeners around the world. Today we are really privileged to have a pioneer of the uh, contemporary Christian music scene with us, Chuck Gerard. Uh, some of you uh, may remember that uh, Chuck uh, actually, he, he helped pioneer the Jesus uh, Movement music, and he was the founding member of Love Song. Yeah, some of you uh, may remember uh, that group and love their music. And he also became a, a solo artist and did had many, several, and did many wonderful things uh, on his own. Uh, he became a solo artist in 1975. Little bio side notes that are that are so kind of neat. His girls seem to have inherited his singing talent. Uh, you may know Alisa Gerard uh, Childers. Uh, she was the founding member member of Zoe Girl, and she's had a string of radio singles. And their their group received a Dove Award. Yeah, so musical family and and with he, there's so much that that Chuck is rich in. He has such a rich past that I'm going to ask the people to hang on to the end of the program to hear some of uh, Chuck's music because we really want to dive right in to the rich history that Chuck has. Good afternoon, Chuck. It's so great to have you with us. Oh, my pleasure, Leah. Thank you. I want to take the opportunity, uh, first and foremost, because this is an election year, before we, we dive into the rich uh, past, I'd like to uh, take a moment, this being an election year here in America, uh, Chuck recently, uh, a short, just a, you know, a few years ago, came out with a song called Heart of America. It's very powerful. It's very touching. I'd like to ask you, Chuck, what was your mindset? What was your heart when you put this song out? Well, I, uh, there was the, the second election for Obama, and without, uh, you know, I'm going to try to transcend politics in this answer uh, to a certain degree, but, you know, we all have our opinions, and I wasn't really pleased with the way the country was going, and I was feeling pretty frustrated uh, one morning. I was, In fact, I was right where I am now, up in Northern California at a friend's house, and uh, I woke up, and uh, this line came to me, give us back the heart of America, because I felt that we had lost a lot of the principles that the nation was found upon and um, so I saw that as sort of the beginning of a, of a song and uh, I began to work on it and uh, as I as I moved into crafting the song you know uh, through the process of finishing up the lyrics and everything I realized that the the real the real solution really wasn't with a political party or who we elected for president, and now it's become even more of a of an issue with the the very strange and unprecedented election that we're involved in now. And I realize that really Christians have to transcend all that. Here's what I really believe: we have to do what we can on the level of where we have some power. We have to vote. We have to vote our conscience. But the real issue is that we raise our sights up to uh, higher than that and realize that the real issue is that God's in control. And uh, so really the only thing we can really do that's effective is to, to pray for our nation and pray for our leaders. Uh, that can be difficult for some. It's difficult for me sometimes as I pray for some of these leaders. But, you know, I find some way to pray for them that they'll really have an experience with God or a Damascus Road experience or whatever, and uh, just do my best to, to do what the Bible tells me to do. But the real issue is that, uh, you know, that that's pa passage of Scripture that's at the end, if my people will humble themselves and, and, and seek the Lord and pray, then he will re restore our nation. And so that's what we have to go on, you know, and it's a little bit like praying for someone to be to be healed of cancer or something. We don't always see the answer to the prayer, but uh, we just do what we know to do and be obedient to what the Bible tells us to do, and that's our best shot. So that's really what the song's about. It's uh, It's got the front part that's about the, um, you know, uh, uh, the, that we want to put the nation into God's hands, and then at the end it kind of makes it uh, a kind of a ending, kind of a 
younger people might not know what I'm talking about, but a Hey Jude ending out of that passage of scripture about if my people. So it was uh, written about that time, and we tried to get it to some key people like Sean Hannity and some of the others that might play it. No one, we did get it to a lot of people close to those people, but no one actually played it on, on the air in that regard, you know, as a part of the election. So I just didn't really push it very much, and now I guess we're in a new election cycle, and maybe it's time for the song again. I absolutely think so. People, go to Chuck Girard, G-I-R-A-R-D site, and uh, uh, aren't you offering this song uh, free or uh, to anyone who wants it? Yes, we we still we offer it free because we believe in the message of the song. Uh, I know that we had revamped the website. I believe it's still free. I'll, I'll go back and double check, and if it's not, we'll make it free. But I'm pretty sure it's a free download still. And uh, yes, absolutely. It can also yeah, be purchased well, if they want to spend the buck. <laughs> oh well, honestly, people, go and go and check this out, and uh, take this song and take his video of it and post it on your Facebook or on your Twitter. It's a timely message. The Lord is still working through Chuck uh, so strongly with timely messages. And and this was just timely. Now, to go back, um, mm-hmm. you talk about a rich history. I'm glad they put this video up on YouTube uh, uh, recently. <clears throat> they have a, a video of uh, Chuck where he's singing uh, for, now this is going way back, Catherine Coleman. Uh, right. even, I mean, what? Rare video, just to even get a video of her in it, is is extremely rare. But uh, this is Chuck as a young man, you know, and he is giving his testimony, and he said something so funny. You know, he was living the the hippie life, and he was in Hawaii, and uh, he was living in a cave, he said, you know, playing his music and was happy. And then he said he was thinking he wanted to do things for God, and how was he going to help the world sitting on a rock in Hawaii? So... He decided to, I guess, you know, come come back into a more mainstream society and make an impact, and an impact he has made. And at this point in time, I'm going to hand the microphone over to uh, Chuck. And Chuck, why don't you just share with our listening audience your highlights that sure. uh, you think of your life? Thank you. Well, let me let me tell you first of all that I've just I finished a book of my my life story that's not actually out yet, but it will be soon. It'll either be self-titled Chuck Gerard or it'll have rock and roll preacher in the title somewhere, and it's the whole detailed story of the whole uh, the whole uh, history of Calvary Chapel and. Christian music from my perspective, and so that might be of interest to people. We're going to try to get it out. If we if we we're looking to get a more of a major book deal right now, and if we can't, then we'll self publish. So it should be hopefully be out this year. So I just want to let people know that if they're interested in these little snippets, I'm going to give. But I was basically raised uh, in a uh, uh, nominal Christian environment, and I blew that off when I was about 15 years old, and. Uh, Started to go out and, and, and taste the world, so to speak, with alcohol and women and the whole deal and got into music. And that led me to, uh, in the 60s, to curiosity about the whole drug scene. I got into the whole drug scene and became a hippie and started studying the Bible and Eastern philosophies and the whole deal. And um, toward the end of 1969, I was in a group of like-minded seekers that were all coming to the end of the road. And uh, as many people were in that that hippie movement, as we had been following these uh, artists like the Beatles and Bob Dylan, thinking they were giving us messages in their music. And we were standing at the uh, at the uh, the brink of disenchantment with all of that around around the latter part of 1969. There were many, many people in the same position. And um, then along comes Calvary Chapel for me and then other churches for other people. And we started to hear about this place where hippies were finding God and Jesus specifically. And I went up there and uh, God nailed me to to the wall in the back seat of that church one night really it had not that much to do with the sermon or anything it was just uh, this amazing experience with God pulling this this pressure off my shoulders this weight that I've been carrying and uh, and it, that was my conversion experience and I turned my life over to God the best I knew how that night and uh, 
then a bunch of my friends that were in this kind of, we had a little kind of a commune thing going. We lived in Laguna Beach in a fairly middle upper middle class home overlooking the ocean. And uh, a bunch of my friends had had similar experiences and we were all musicians. And so uh, we, we had these songs we've been writing about our experiences of seeking God. And we went up to the chapel. Uh, we'd only been Christians about three weeks and we went up to the chapel to uh, see if Chuck would let us play. Chuck Smith, the senior pastor at the time. And um, he took us out to the uh, sanctuary and interviewed us and um, wasn't really too keen on a bunch of hippies that are only three weeks old in the Lord playing you know, on his platform. But at the very end of the short interview, he asked us to play a song and we played a song called Welcome Back. And uh, the Holy Spirit fell on him and uh, touched his heart. And the next thing we heard was he asked us if we could play that night. And so we asked him what time the service was, and he said 7 o'clock. And we told him that one of our guys was in Orange County Jail doing weekends, but he gets out at 6. So I think we can pick him up and make the service. And so then we uh, we came in and we played that night with a hippie preacher named Lonnie Frisbee, and the place was electric. The kids loved it. Uh, they began to evangelize all their friends. The church grew from about 200 to 2,000 in about four months. We moved into a circus tent for a few years till they built the sanctuary that was there. And then as we, as that all happened around us, we also had our own ministry as Love Song began to be, uh, get a lot of publicity through the publicity at Calvary Chapel and we became a well-known band. And I'm almost at the end of the uh, synopsis here. And then uh, we got invited to uh, uh, an event called Explo in 1972 in Dallas. And uh, on a Friday night in the Cotton Bowl, for the first time for many of the 100,000 plus evangelical Christians that had gathered in the Cotton Bowl, they had never seen hippies minister. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, you know, they weren't sure hippies were really saved anyhow. And uh, so we got up and we played. And after we played, Billy Graham got up and spoke. And I, I really see that as, a, as a, a, a tipping point, a paradigm shift in Christian music, because I think that a lot of people thought, well, if Billy Graham will get up after hippies play, then maybe they're OK. Maybe it's OK with God. And I think that was a place where people's minds open to the idea of that we maybe we could have drums in church and we could have electric guitars and be a little more current and relate to the current generation. And uh, so that was kind of the whole beginning. That was of the first couple, three years there at Calvary Chapel were very formative years for Christian music and for the church in general with what the press finally called the Jesus movement. So that's kind of the, you know, the Cook's tour history here. And that, that's incredible. And uh, Chuck's band, Love Song, did open up the door uh, for many of the um, like-minded uh, musicians to come and bring it full forth and minister to a generation uh, in a way, like Chuck said, uh, they could relate to. Uh, I liked uh, Chuck Smith and his message. He spoke on the end times a lot, and he reached a lot of people and had so many artists come on. I can remember we had... Um, Bob Bennett on our program a little sure. while ago, and when he revisited uh, the Calvary Chapel before uh, Chuck, uh, uh, before uh, Pastor uh, Smith passed away, he said, "Gee, I, I mentioned I'd only been saved a couple of weeks, and I wasn't invited back for two years." <laughs> so it just kind of reminded me, like you said, he was kind of hesitant. You've only been with the Lord how many weeks? But you know. Yeah, honestly, it doesn't matter. Once the Lord's in your heart, you instantly witness. You just instantly go out and you bear right. witness to what you know of Him. But, uh, Chuck, um, uh, your music. Okay. Uh, what style of music? Yours is very different from anybody else's. And, um, at least that's how I perceive it. Tell me your style, your method. What's behind that? Well, I don't know how to, I can't evaluate, you know, you, we just all have our roots in music and uh, our influences. Mine were heavily into the Beatles and the Beach Boys, the band. I, you know, it used to be Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, and then it became the Beach Boys, the band, and the Beatles. And uh, those were my influences. And really, the, the one thing that's of note about the whole movement back then, if you want to call it a movement, was that it was really nothing that was uh, planned or, uh, you know, um, done by any um, machinery of man. It was all God doing it, and it was obvious if you were involved in it. And so what we were doing, we were just writing songs 
primarily I was the main writer, but Tommy Coombs wrote some songs and some of the guys contributed as well. And we co-wrote some songs, but they were just basically songs we'd write if we weren't Christians. We weren't trying to be a, you know, to figure out uh, a genre. Well, let's see, what do the kids relate to? Let's put drums in this, you know, because kids like drums now. It was really the, the DNA music of our lives. And uh, so we just started to write from where we were. But now we had these eternal lyrics that we could write about. You know, I had been writing songs before as a Christian, but my songs were always about the questions of life. And now I had, you know, I was able to write songs about the answers to those questions. And it was amazing to me that I could write songs now that have eternal value that people could find the Lord through my songs, that people could be taught through my songs. These were huge things to me, very, very amazing reality that I, that my music could have such an influence and an impact on people's lives. And over the years, you know, even to this day, we still get stories now through Facebook and everything about how, what, how the music impacted people in those early days. But it was just, it wasn't really something we sat down, you know, it was just the music that we would write, uh, even if we weren't Christians. And uh, so our music had sort of a, you know, a flavor of the, the bands that were my influences and yet my own. I'm a real heavy into background vocals and, uh, you know, um, I still just wrote my own songs. I didn't copy people, but I, it was an unconscious thing. But it, it created a music that was sort of, I guess, folk rock. And it was the model for a lot of young bands in those days. Really, if you look back at it, about the time that we hit the scene, there really was the now, Larry Normans was un unquestionably the first. When I became a Christian, his album, Upon This Rock, had already come out. And uh, it was a, big, a huge thing to me. I thought, wow, oh, look, this guy's doing what we want to do. And um, then Andre was doing, Andre Crouch was doing, uh, you know, more progressive things in uh, black gospel music. And maybe you had Randy Matthews and, and uh, Barry McGuire. But that was about it back in those early days because Maranatha Music hadn't come along yet. The second chapter, Keith Green, none of those people had appeared yet. So it, were, it was very heavy influence on young people. And I think one of the contributions of Love Song, the two things that I think that we contributed were, first of all, we were the user-friendly group. That's the uh, parent-friendly group. You know, if you've didn't look, if you put the look aside for a while, the songs were not real heavy rock, you know, so parents could kind of go, okay, well, maybe it's okay, you know, this sounds pretty good, and um, so that was a huge contribution was, uh, as I, as I look back on it after all these years, was sort of like, uh, you know, helping it to cross over into the church, that the church could see this music could be used, and it was could be effective for God, so... And there was a second one, but I forgot what it was. It was a second uh, kind of an influence thing that, that I wanted to mention, but uh, let's move on. You know, um, I, I agree with you. It was a crossover for many. It has a very calming effect uh, if you listen to uh, most of Chuck's movie. And Love Song, you, know, you mentioned his song, Welcome Back. I mean, it kind of sounds like a little Hawaiian island, you know, a little touch to it there, uh, influence. And it's... Um, it's it's just a nice taste, you know, uh, song. And mm -hmm. yes, uh, a second chapter of X. Weren't they your backup group at one time? Um, well, they they. It was really interesting. They came down to the studio. Uh, I'm not sure whether we actually officially ha had the idea to have. They sang on sometimes Hallelujah, and um, Billy Ray Hearn was their label president, and he loved the song. He when he heard it, he, it had not been released yet. And he said, "This is going to be a big song." And um, so I think that maybe it was his suggestion that second chapter, who I knew by that time, would get involved. And those guys came in, and, you know, they were so incredible. They made up their part as they went along, and I just got chills as they began to sing. You know, they were making up what they were going to sing on the record, and it's a, an amazing, wonderful part of that record is what they contributed to it. But that was the only um, song that they, you know, we weren't like a, you know, a recording regular, so, you know, in that regard, they just, uh, help me on that one song. That what is what is the um, to you? Um, what is what is the, what? The, uh, what is the prophetic voice today in music? What do you think uh, is is the surge right now for today? Yeah, you know, it's hard for me to evaluate that because in in a lot of ways I'm disconnected. I, I hear more about the newer artists through my kids and the, my kids' friends. Um, 
I I can't really evaluate, like when you say a prophetic voice, what is music saying to lead us in a way? I think probably the most profound impact now of modern music, more modern music is that there's some really great worship stuff coming out, you know, that uh, it isn't all wonderful. And there's some problems I have with the whole uh, paradigm of it, you know, that you have these bands like Hillsong and uh, Jesus Culture that, you know, have incredible, some incredible songs, wonderful stuff, but it's not really something that can be achieved by the average church. So people get this uh, experience, of, and it could be a genuine experience. I've never been to one of the live events, but I've seen videos, and I think like Kim Walker is amazing, for instance. Uh, but um, I just don't know how it fits into the whole, uh, you know, whether it's a separation from the church where you kind of go, I have to go to this event to worship God and see Hillsong or, uh, or whether it's a good thing. You know, it's actually, ironically, what we had sort of, wanted for us well if we could just get people into a stadium and we could play for them and we could you know lead them in worshiping jesus now we have that kind of thing going and i'm kind of wondering if the overall impact is all that positive because of that unachievable you know it's excellent wonderful music lighting the whole thing and then you go into your church and they've got three musicians on stage that uh can barely play but here's the deal. I'd rather have the three that could barely play if they're anointed than the big show. And I come into some of these churches and I see the, you know, the big production worship. And uh, for me, it's kind of, I get a disconnect from that. It doesn't really dry, draw me in. So that still doesn't answer your question. Getting back to the prophetic element, I re- don't really know. I mean, I imagine that would come more from the, the single songwriter kind of people. And there are some people that are, you know, that I hear some of their music and, um, I think that there's some really good songs there, but I really, I'm not in the flow today that, like I was. It's I'm not actually really drawn to it, uh, you know, like I might have been uh, at an earlier time. So that's the best answer I have for that. I don't know. In other words, I don't know what God is actually saying through music today other than, you know, putting more of a premium on worshiping, which is the highest calling of music. So that would be, uh, if, if people are being drawn into worship, then that's a good thing. I think music, like a good sermon, it's all about the message, and it's all about the heart of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, like uh, Charles Spurgeon said, what? No Christ in your sermon? Then go home until you find something worthy to talk about. And I know that during your generation, it was about personal relationship. Uh, with Christ, and I think that there are some anointed artists today uh, that write this way, but I'll tell you something, more and more people that I talk to, very young people, will say, wow, there's just something about that other generation of music. That yes, I, I hear really that all the time, like too. Me. Yeah, because it's a, one thing I learned at radio years ago is they said it's a one-on-one. When you flip that switch on the talk, there could be a million people listening, but there's only one person listening. Exactly. You know, at the time, you need to do one-on-one. And there's nothing like a guy with an acoustic guitar, you know, and, and a, a couple of vocal backups just, just singing one-on-one and making it personal. Who doesn't like a personal contact? And I feel that's how the Lord feels, a personal relationship. Mm-hmm. Yet, I, yet I believe if it's done in the spirit, you know, and in God's will, there's, it's great that you could have backing and, and funds to do it uh, on a grander scale with orchestra. But like you said, people who try to replicate it, there's three guys in a church. But I agree with you with what you said. I'd rather listen to an anointing of three guys than maybe right. a group that might be out of the spirit. So we have about two minutes left. Is there anything in closing? Because we're going to be adding some of your music to to our broadcast. We want to leave time for that. Is there anything you'd like to mention in closing, Chuck? Well, that's always the toughest thing. I don't know how many interviews you've done, but that's the question we all hate the most. You know, it'll be profound in two minutes. I just like to encourage the younger generation, maybe if I have this minute here, is to, to you know to keep it real. And and one of the things that. Um, uh, has happened as I watched Zoe Girl go through, you know, when my daughter go through Zoe Girl, and I saw the uh, 
much more influence of the industry part of it, influencing how they did their songs and all that and kind of controlling it. Uh, just encourage the young kids to keep it real and keep it between you and Jesus and keep your life straight, you know, so that you're really, what you're singing about, the goal is not to be a Christian artist. The goal is to be a servant. And if Christian artistry is part of that servanthood, then that's a legitimate thing. But a lot of these kids are, are wanting to achieve, a, you know, go after a musical career. And really, if you want to succeed, in my opinion, you have to see what God's given you as your gifts and talents. It may, music may be a small part of a, a larger calling of maybe being a preacher or a prophet or a teacher or something. So to carefully evaluate all these things and not get the American Idol glitter in your eyes that your dream is music. Let your dream be Jesus and see how music fits into that dream. That's my, the best counsel I could give a young person. And that's a beautiful message, Chuck. And people, again, if you want to connect uh, with uh, Chuck, uh, you definitely uh, look him up on the social sites, but definitely go to Chuck Gerard's uh, website. Uh, here's some of his uh, most recent music as well. I want to thank you so much for being with us today, Chuck. I also want to mention that you can YouTube me for hours because <laughs> my YouTubes go way back into my secular career with hot rod music and surf music. I was the lead vocalist on the song called Little Honda, First Gear It's All Right, and all the way back to my doo-wop days. So you can have a lot of fun on YouTube. Yeah, I, like I said, my favorite is the one with Catherine Coleman. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, I know. Definitely check them out on YouTube as well. Until okay. next time, I'm going to end this program as I always do. I'm Leah reminding you that God loves you. Oh, how he loves you. It's the name above all names. And we will declare it. We will declare it. It's the name above all names And we will shout it to a dying world Who will declare my name Who will shout my name in the middle of the nation who would take the shield of faith and the sword of my tongue And declare my name to a dying world He who has declared me thus far Will walk in even greater power for the sands of time are running out But my name will be declared In this final hour I am Jehovah My words in your mouths will set the captives.